being implemented uh, would handle this. But uh, no mechanisms were structured to either evaluate the pipeline or confirm the product results. Next slide, please. Next slide. When we initially started to share our information, uh, we found that actually all of these programs were tackling multiple changes at the same time. But none of them had developed a shared vision of what all of this change would mean and how it would happen. Different parts of the programs were making choices for various aspects of each one of these shifts that impacted each other, but they were not really collaborating and coordinating. Cost and schedule were the primary drivers, and other qualities were assumed to just be there or be secondary. Um, however, many of these were uh, directly impacted by these choices. Uh, we were seeing that roles would have to change, governance would have to change. There was a lot of cross-team collaboration in terms of decision-making that increased exponentially because of these shifts. Um, so we're looking at uh, increased software, we're looking at uh, agile development with DevSecOps, and we're also looking at a movement to shared infrastructure as three of the primary divide, uh, drivers. This lack of shared view, however, um, left all of the pieces in movement and no one really had a plan for how all of these would fit together. Uh, each one was being initiated on their own timetable and um, each decision was being made at different points in time that um, we were seeing some very strong uncertainties in terms of the impact, especially on cybersecurity. When we looked at all of these, we figured that we would start with this shift to DevSecOps as our starting point uh, because we were really grappling with how do we evaluate a pipeline uh, in terms of its cybersecurity and software assurance. Um, so we chose to focus on a path on how to build this vision. Next slide. Tangentially, um, there were also new policies and guidance that were being interest, uh, issued. And again, none of this was tied into a vision for the program. Um, so what they were actually doing and how they were approaching it remained unclear. Um, there were opportunities for uh, adaptive acquisition pathways, uh, changes in potential ATO that everyone was anxious to adopt but no one really knew how, um, and shifting in terms of uh, um, some of the nuclear surety issues as well in terms of uh, some of the discussions for uh, integrating software into that very sensitive and highly concerned area. Each program was building their own path, and it looked like there was an awful lot of synergy that we could capitalize. Next slide, please. What we were seeing, if a program only focused on implementing DevSecOps without critically considering its impact on the other parts of the programs, that they were going to end up with a lot of resulting capability, but there was a real concern about its defensibility and stability. Given the increase of challenges that we've seen in just the last few months with uh, ransomware and supply chain challenges, uh, this was raising major concerns. The programs, as I said earlier, were relying on pipeline tools and automation to find vulnerabilities, um, and there are limitations to those tools and limitations to the knowledge of how to apply them that looked like they were going to be creating challenges. Compliance may be satisfied by executing the tools, but there is a high rate of false positives that can overwhelm developers uh, if they don't know how to handle these. 
of particular concern to us with the operational security was the challenge of specifying controls but without really understanding the operational risk and the outcomes that were going to be a challenge. Um, we were concerned that we had potential gaps that would represent opportunities for attackers. So the sustainment activities uh, became a, a real focus for us. And we didn't see anything in the decision-making process that was really looking at this uh, end game, the vision. Next slide. We also didn't see a real understanding of what the adoption of DevSecOps meant. Um, I want to share with you what we have put together as our perspective in this next couple of slides. Adopting a DevSecOps approach is not just setting up tools and automation. Uh, the role of the pipeline, how it's structured to meet that role, and the quality of the product it produces has to be carefully considered as an integrated whole. This is a complex collection of parts that are organized to work together on, based on specific user knowledge and expertise to meet specific needs of an organization. Each pipeline is unique, but ultimately um, produces the same approach in terms of uh, speeding up the development process. In reality, there are two joined process flows that have to be designed, managed, and used together. Uh, and we find fewer thinking in those terms. The first one is a software factory that continuously flows through the plan, develop, build, test, release steps, and then into potentially deliver, deploy, operate, monitor, and feedback uh, as a loop. Uh, it uses platforms, tools, and pre-structured controls uh, in place to support this uh, product flow. The second is the integrated pipeline capabilities, uh, which are more than just an infrastructure platform. Uh, these are uh, more software, essentially controlling software, uh, and these require the same constant uh, and close administration to ensure that you've got the right tools and controls uh, and access available at all times for the right resources to perform the desired steps in the product flow. Um, so there is a very heavy administration and structuring burden, uh, and the software is essentially controlling the construction of software. Um, since each pipeline is unique in both the product and the structure, planning for uh, smooth and effective flow at scale, which is what we are seeing uh, these programs needing, is critical. And that planning piece is where our major concern is coming in into play for cybersecurity as part of it. Next slide. If we look in a little more depth at the product side, um, the product should be um, the factory, rather, should be software production and automation continually increasing as the system itself grows and matures. So you've got uh, initial pieces that started and then added functionality and capability that increase the system itself. Uh, this should lead also to continually recognizing vulnerabilities and decreasing them in the operational field as you're consist consistently applying tools that should improve vulnerability removal uh, and reduce vulnerability injection. However, this reality is dependent on trained developers who know how to use the tools and when to apply them. It's based on sprint planning. It allows time to not only find, but also prioritize and fix the vulnerability. Uh, effectiveness will only be known if there is tracking in place to assemble all of the various pieces of information from each of the tools that are being used and the process steps to determine that the remaining vulnerabilities in the product 
have indeed been reduced. Um, and we are not seeing this focus on monitoring and tracking as part of any standard tool chain right now. Next, uh, next slide, please. Assembling the materials for the pipeline infrastructure, which is this outer loop that we have, uh, must take into account that none of these building blocks are actually static. Service providers are constantly upgrading their environment to keep the technology, which would be hardware, firmware, and software current. And third-party tools that would be integrated are also uh, continually in need of patching uh, and upgrading to improve functionality and uh, stay current uh, with known uh, uh, vulnerabilities. All of these could potentially represent inherited risks from the supply chain. New and improved tools are also becoming available and may need to be integrated into the pipeline to address new types of vulnerabilities. Um, how will these be made known to the developers? How will the developers be trained in these new tools? And when do they become part of an improved pipeline if we're doing automation and tying these pieces together uh, for speed? Uh, if these new tools find vulnerabilities previous, previously missed, then how do we go back and look at the code that was built previously to improve that? Uh, all of these are involved in pieces of planning how the infrastructure supports the product uh, and need to be part of that plan that I was talking about. Next slide. We found that some of the programs we were working with were forgetting that the pipeline is only a portion of the full life cycle for uh, a major program. Um, the pipeline is primarily applied to new development and delivery in those major pieces. Um, and so many were ignoring weaknesses that could be introduced by other parts of the acquisition through code reuse, through third-party software products that were included. Uh, all of those are uh, other potential vulnerabilities that need to be thought about in terms of the final product. Um, so total reliance on just the DevSecOps pipeline for all of the cybersecurity and software assurance does not make sense. Uh, in every step of the acquisition, uh, there are weaknesses that could be introduced and um, areas that need to be considered of having potential um, mission impact. Uh, there are other methods such as uh, threat analysis, abuse and misuse case analysis, mission threat analysis, and architecture analysis that are all needed to supplement either before or after what the pipeline is doing uh, because many of these are uh, working on pieces that then become input to the pipeline. Next slide, please. We think this diagram better describes the complexity of what's being dealt with and what we need to. Um, and planning for how these various pieces integrate is critical if you really want to reap the benefits of the pipeline uh, for the system cybersecurity and software assurance. We have seen a major challenge in the programs in terms of recognizing that these pieces need to be understood and structured in a way that they can be worked together. Uh, because too frequently our organizational structures within a program subdivide these parts to different groups. And many of these groups don't work together. Um, and there are many layers of interdependency that if you're going to reap the benefits of a pipeline uh, need to be part of how you're planning the approach. Next slide. The second challenge that I want to emphasize is the high dependency of cybersecurity of the product on the pipeline. So that when you're evaluating the risk of the product, you need to be considering what assumptions have you made about the pipeline, the infrastructure, the shared services, 
all of these pieces that are working together uh, to provide cybersecurity results. Um, many of these are parts that programs have limited control over, and they are just components that they are inheriting risk from. Um, the administrators of the pipeline will define how all these parts work together, and they'll be established sequences of processes. All of these need to be looked at in terms of how they contribute or not to uh, the um, cybersecurity results of the end product. Um, because of this level of complexity and diversity of participants, uh, we are seeing that there really is no one in charge of monitoring the overall health of the pipeline. Um, because the structures are so widely distributed. Uh, and by health, I mean the combination of the infrastructure and the product development to actually ensure that there aren't gaps, that the pieces are working smoothly together and are well coordinated. Um, this uh, complexity leaves uh, opportunities for adversaries. And we've certainly seen one of those in our current experience with solar winds coming into the supply chain. Um, so the risk is real. Uh, and what we have been looking at is trying to figure out how do we structure this in a way that we can think about it uh, and plan for it uh, effectively. Next slide. I want to give you a little bit more concrete perspective on the complexity uh, and why it's a concern. Um, if we look at the administration tools, um, there are a group of them around the pipeline that control many of the interfaces and uh, various aspects of pipeline support. Um, the little diagram in the top right on this slide uh, looks at the interfaces and the um, parts and pieces that need to, to work together. Um, and tuning the tools um, can increase the flow through the pipeline, uh, but this really requires a lot of interrelationships and trust relationships among all of these different pieces. Uh, the administrative resources that support the pipeline will now control what each participant can see, and um, in addition, this goes beyond the typical authentication and authorization roles. So we've increased the administrative level of control, but are the tools performing as expected? Um, this is a presumption um, that's built on expected behavior, but looking at how do we monitor for these and identify anomalies um, has not been uh, well structured. Um, the tools are assumed to only perform as expected. As you can see, there is an awful lot of coupling among all of these parts and pieces as the pipeline is being structured. Uh, if we move to the next slide, um, you can see the pieces of these interfaces a little more closely and how tightly they coupled. Um, there's a lot of data that's collected in each one of these steps, but the correlation of it and the comparison of it of expected versus anomaly behavior really is not well structured and has not really been established as um, a required responsibility. Um, the focus has been on a facilitating flow uh, and confirming performance of each defined step, but when we're really looking at the product and the software assurance of that product uh, and the cybersecurity results of that product, we need to understand how all these pieces are working together to uh, address that. Next slide. At an even more granular level, uh, each tool requires specific technical knowledge to administer and use it. Um, the tools are selected to focus on specific development and security needs at each step in the pipeline, and they will be administered by different resources based on their technical expertise. Uh, from what we have seen, no one with 
sufficiency in their depth of knowledge to identify anomalies um, has um, sufficient access and responsibility for addressing the security of the overall pipeline. So it's very much of a piecemeal approach that we have been seeing is being implemented based on uh, leveraging existing knowledge. Um, not an unexpected result because the expertise to do this uh, is uh, not readily available. Um, and these individuals, in some cases, need very broad knowledge and understanding to even set up the materials and the tools and get them working. Um, but if we're looking at it from a cybersecurity perspective and we're trying to establish how we're going to rely on it, we have to really understand the choices that are made, how these pieces are implemented, um, and begin to assemble the data that's generated from each one of these pieces to start to put together uh, a perspective of um, the full activities and the interface trust relationships that are there and monitor them. Um, the speed is not the only thing that we need to be looking at in terms of the pipeline. We really have to understand what are we relying on and is that trust well placed. Next slide. Here we show even more of the complexity. Uh, for each one of the operational processes, they use different components of the pipeline. How these processes are structured, monitored, and maintained will determine the level of oversight that's even feasible. Um, because of this complexity, the current focus has always been on getting these things to work. But working is only one part of it. We also have to make sure that it's not doing things we don't want it to do. Uh, and we're dealing with not only software, but uh, pieces that are tools, scripts, data, all of these are parts of the pipeline infrastructure and parts of the product. In many cases, they're stored in the same places, uh, and access just depends on the role and responsibility of uh, the individual doing the access. So how we look at these and how they're working together becomes a, a very complex uh, interface, a complex problem. Next slide. Our working group identified that um, we have this need for understanding and managing the pipeline. But in order to evaluate the pipeline, we basically need a model of how it should operate. And then we can come in and look at a given pipeline and say, is this one meeting expectations? Are there gaps? How can we then evaluate the discrepancies and identify problem areas? So we have chosen to focus on a platform independent model that we can then uh, apply and show where there are gaps within a given pipeline. Um, the model itself we are anticipating would provide a basis then for us to be looking at uh, threats and an attack surface for a specific program. But it would start as where we where we want it to be as opposed to where it is. And then each program's choices would allow us to evaluate the gaps and determine are those critical or are they still meeting what the program needs. Next slide. We're developing this reference architecture in a modeling language similar to what we would do if we were modeling a system. Uh, because we are thinking about this as a very complex system. And then we can take this architecture and look at a specific instance and compare the ways in which the model uh, is reflected in that specific system or potential gaps. Um, 
And so what we were on right now is developing the first version of this uh, independent reference model. That's been no small challenge. Um, there are many different perspectives that we're including in it. And then one of the key questions becomes, how detailed should this model be? What we're anticipating is a dual prong use of this model, one for existing programs that are on DevSecOps that they can then take this reference model and compare it to the pipeline that they've already set up. But the second usage then too would be to take the reference model itself, tailor it, and then use that as the model to actually build uh, a new pipeline. Uh, and both of those purposes we think are viable based on how we're approaching this problem space. Next slide. We're using a model-based engineering methodology specifically because we feel it's been successful in building complex systems. And this is certainly, I hope you understand, uh, based on what I've said so far, a complex system. Um, we have an initial publication, which I've referenced in the slide here, that can provide you with some of the details of what we've done in terms of looking at the challenge area and how we are approaching building the model. Our team is currently assembling the model in um, using Cameo, um, but we know this can be readily ported to other frameworks. Um, the model currently includes requirements, capabilities, um, detailed definitions because we found that the use of terminology was one of the biggest struggles that we had in terms of even describing a pipeline. Um, so clarity there was critical. And we're also looking at what are the expected processes uh, that need to be part of the pipeline that are important to the cybersecurity aspects of what we need to do. Um, We've also ended up needing to structure capabilities around maturity uh, because organizations as they're standing up a pipeline need to understand where do we start and then how do we then increase the capabilities that we have for cybersecurity and assurance uh, because these are very complex with roles, responsibilities, and processes and um, are not something that you can just add on quickly. Um, they require a lot of planning and structuring and integration. Next slide. One of the things we have identified is that we have to take an enterprise approach. Um, just looking at the pipeline itself and how it's operating does not provide us sufficient information about is the pipeline um, a capable one because we are essentially relying on a lot of the organizational capabilities are the resources that are being brought in to actually operate this pipeline uh, trained? Are the standards that are being used uh, appropriate to what the product is that the pipeline is producing? Are the trust relationships and the decisions that are being made about that um, effective based on the governance that the organization has in place and the engineering capabilities? All of those go beyond, in many cases, a single program or a single system. So the enterprise has to be effective at coordinating all of this participation among acquisition, engineering, cybersecurity, and potentially other units. Uh, sometimes this can be done at the program office, but in many cases we're finding that this is beyond just the program. So we're looking at more than um, a, a contained environment. We are looking at all of this um, capability having to be able to be drawn on from the organization. 
Um, so what we have come up with is the recognition that there is, to a certain extent, a minimum viable enterprise that could even be capable of um, constructing a DevSecOps approach and implementing it. In some cases, many of these capabilities will even come outside of the enterprise. They will be third party. And so the enterprise itself has to be capable of integrating the supply chain into uh, all of these pieces with the services they're using, the third parties and how they're monitored and managed, how they do their contracting. All of these, again, tie into what is a minimum viable enterprise that can put these pieces together. With each pipeline being unique, we need to know that the needs of the product will be addressed, but we have to be able to draw on a range of capabilities that can then be tied together um, to produce that product. So we feel that this um, independent model will start to provide a baseline where we can then come in and start to evaluate at a starting point, the model itself, but indirectly the enterprise and how well the enterprise can actually feed what needs to be done and supported by the pipeline. Next slide. So where are we going? As with other components, we have to recognize that Cybersecurity and software assurance are not static. So what we need to be able to do is create a DevSecOps pipeline that can not only support the product that needs to be there, but can also be flexible enough to support the changes in the operational environment and the threat pictures that can force changes within the product to deal with this. It's a balancing act. And so we're looking at this model being a starting point for how we begin to understand this balancing act. What are the trade-offs that need to be made among all of the different qualities for uh, a, um, a product and a system so that we can have effective operational security? Uh, right now, we see too many programs focusing on just defining a stack of controls that they then layer on top of a system to say, this should protect us. In some cases, they're overprotecting. In some areas, they're underprotecting. And right now, we don't really have a good way of determining how those pieces need to work together. But we think with a model that that defines a baseline of how should the cybersecurity work and how should it relate to the pipeline, which we want to rely on for automating these pieces, that we can then begin to evaluate how well we are tying these pieces and parts together and look for gaps where we should be concerned. Um, and not have to look at evaluating each individual control over and over and over. We also will be able to reap the benefits of all of this data that the pipelines themselves collect so that if we are smart about it, we can then begin to monitor and show that we are improving the output results of the product itself. But that requires good planning and organizing for this data and structures in place to begin to understand it. We know the data part we haven't dug into as much, but we certainly do think that the structures and the pieces and the, the problem space of beginning to look at how we think about cybersecurity relative to the pipeline is something that we've made a good start on. Uh, we're anticipating having a first cut at the model available in the fall, uh, and we hope that this will be something that you will be interested in uh, uh, understanding and potentially helping us to expand and improve. Next slide. Yeah, this is obviously a work in process. 
so that we have um, plenty of, uh, of room for uh, additional insights. Uh, we're working with a subset of programs. Uh, I'm sure we don't, we haven't identified everything that's needed, but we feel like we've got a good starting point. Uh, and so as we move into making this available, which we hope to have in the fall, as I said, um, we hope this will be something that uh, uh, will be useful to you and will be something that you will be able to provide us feedback on and uh, uh, help us improve it over time. At this point, I'll be happy to handle any questions that will come in. Um, and uh, I thank you for your time. Well, thank you for that presentation, Carol. That's a uh, uh, excellent, excellent work on a uh, complex problem, and it's a, it's a very Im important uh, activity that you're undertaking here. So, uh, we did get a, a number of questions in from our from our attendees. Uh, a couple came in uh, regarding um, software bill of materials, and uh, one was wondering if you and your project included or considered SBOM, and if you could comment on how the uh, software bill of materials uh, deliverable can be managed with the speed and variability of the DevSecOps approach. We have been looking at SBOM. Um, I've been participating in a lot of the discussions about the standards and how they're um, emerging. Um, and it looks like it could be a valuable tool going forward. Obviously, we're going to need a lot of buy-in from um, all of the participants in software development to uh, construct the pieces of SBOM, but then we're also going to need to have tooling that we can put in place within the pipeline that will mine this information and organize it in useful ways that we can then uh, react to it to understand what is included in the product, to have that help us uh, with understanding the risks that we may have taken on, and also potentially down the road help us uh, better um, maintain those elements within a system uh, and keep them more current uh, and keep them more uh, uh, up to date because a lot of hidden pockets of, of risk come in because people are not aware that they have uh, certain products in, in their system. But SBOM, is, at this point, I think um, too much in the um, the starting stages for us to be able to leverage it yet into the um, uh, pipeline uh, model, but we are certainly keeping an eye on it because we think that has real opportunity going forward. Thanks. Uh, and just to uh, clarify for one of our users, uh, the, the term is, uh, S, uh, they, they were asking just what SBOM is, and it's Software Bill of Materials. Bill so of that, material. that's what that is. So um, so we had a question, uh, question on uh, if you had any thoughts on developing the uh, platform independent model of reference architect architecture using SysML. As I understand it, um, what we're doing in Cameo can be ported to SysML with no problem. Um, we have explored porting it to uh, other sources. I'm not working directly with that level of the tool itself. Um, so that's a little outside of my wheelhouse. Um, but my understanding is that we would be able to support that so it shouldn't be a barrier. Okay, it might be in the same vein, but there was also a quick uh, a question about sec secure UML. So I, I, I don't know if the SysML and the secure UML are uh, kind of in the in that same level of detail that you're uh, you were um, referring to. Yeah, I'm not an expert on the Cameo at this point, but I would anticipate that's something we could certainly explore as we get the first release of the model ready. Um, to um, make it as accessible as possible. Okay, great. Thanks, Carol. Uh, so there was a question. Um, why not use uh, Do DoDAF or TOGAF or the standard enterprise architecture approach and modify that? 
Um, there, a note uh, that uh, FE, FEA2 is a good start as well. And the uh, same, same user also is wondering if this was a digital or paper-based uh, MBSE. A, this is a digital environment that we're using uh, entirely. And uh, we found that DODAS doesn't support processes and the interrelationships among the different views as well as Cameo does because um, several of us have had experience with, with using those others. As I understand it, we can export to that tool, uh, but you'll lose some of the interrelationships that we've been able to uh, clearly articulate in the Cameo model. Uh, we're not wedded to Cameo as a tool. It was just one that we happen to have. So I wanted to, to let you folks know that that was uh, one that we had had some experience with. So that's the one we went with. Uh, so it was a question uh, following up on that was individuals wondering if uh, BPMN will be used, uh, the kind of concurring that the DODEF was processes don't work as well either. I'm not as familiar with that one. So I will have to look into that at a later point in time. Okay, great. One of my, Fair knowledge, enough. One of my knowledge gaps. Not, not a problem, not a problem. Um, let's see, there was a question. Uh, what level of automation do you expect to realize for evaluating PSMs through the uh, lens of the PIM? I think the level of automation will depend on how well the PSM is structured. Um, I think we can support comparisons very readily um, because all of our information is structured electronically. Um, and there are capabilities of comparing different parts of the model to each other depending on where you want to do a deep dive. Um, but we found in many cases those that are actually building the pipeline have not really clearly defined how all the pieces work together. Uh, it's more of uh, ad hoc um, agreed upon uh, steps rather than clearly modeled steps. Um, so I think the comparison piece is going to be dependent on how well the uh, individual PSMs themselves have been structured. Great, thank you. Um, so an individual was wondering uh, that, you know, Considering the amount of data that's being collected by the pipeline, uh, just wondering if your research group has considered uh, utilizing machine learning to help in that process. We're exploring machine learning with some of the uh, tools that we're actually developing um, to uh, mine some of this data. Um, and, but that's more down at the specific uh, data analysis level. Um, we haven't actually seen anything yet that we feel would help us at the modeling stage right now. Um, but certainly, um, I think as more models are applied, more PSNs exist, um, there may be ways that we can mine data from those to um, uh, at least compare to and better understand potential gaps in the PIM. Um, so it's, it's certainly an opportunity going down the road. Uh, but I think we have to call before we can even walk or run. And I think machine learning is a little ways down the road for us. Okay, thank you. Um, so earlier in your presentation, when you were talking about the uh, pipeline and introducing um, you know, it, new tools, you know, uh, so an individual was uh, wondering is when you integrate the new tools, uh, does that have a tendency to decrease the productivity of the uh, pipeline for a while as these, these new tools uh, get incorporated? Well, I think it depends on what the tools are doing, whether they're part of the direct build process or whether they're more support tools that could be put on the um, parts that are not uh, directly in the, the detailed timing. Uh, we're actually exploring integrating um, 
two new tools that are coming out in uh, the um, SEI research uh, that are improving secure coding and looking at building a plan for how we would go about integrating those into a pipeline. Uh, we've actually identified that there are multiple areas where you can uh, integrate new tools. Uh, you can integrate them in your overnight build processes. You can integrate them actually in the developer flow, or you can integrate them in a ancillary process that works on the side that then feeds information back into the developer uh, to help them better improve their product. Um, and all of those have different structures and different um, constraints um, in terms of what you would what you would do. What we found um, that is a key part of looking at that tool integration is measurement to be taken before you tie the tool in and then measurement afterwards to ensure that you are making improvements. Um, and those measurements might be in the speed of the pipeline in terms of what is your impact, but what we're also looking at is measurements in terms of the actual final product and the level of risk that it still contains, the uh, vulnerabilities that still remain there. Um, have we improved, reduced them? Um, so it may be that you may be willing to take a somewhat of a performance hit if your end product has much more improved results and would actually gain you speed in subsequent um, cycles. So everything's a trade-off, um, but I think one of the keys is that when you're looking at making a change in the pipeline, you look at it from the standpoint not just of the rate of throughput, but overall how is this improving the product as well as the pipeline. No, just to follow up on that, we had a couple of comments come in through uh, YouTube, um, and they were talking about the um, addressing the cybersecurity in in the pipeline and talking about being pro proactive um, in that process. Uh, the individual made a comment um, uh, regarding the U.S. auto industry, you know, where they where they learned that trying to fix the problem at the end of the assembly line wouldn't produce qu quality. So, um, you know, it's necessary to, you know, Kind of move those things up front in order to. Uh, oh yes. Yeah. Okay. Like, like I said, I just agreed. wanted. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, like I said, just wanted to. You know, that came in from one of our our uh, YouTube viewers. So I just wanted to, uh, you know, get that uh, get that comment out to the uh, out to the group there. Uh, we actually have documented results around quality improvements that show it's much cheaper to do it earlier. Um, and uh, that, uh, I think, has been fairly consistently documented. But one of the challenges we have is convincing management that they need to do that um, because it's an earlier outlay of time and effort that they don't necessarily see um, in that earlier stage. Uh, and so there is this human tendency to try and make each stage you're in as short as possible. Uh, but the end result is that you're lengthening the uh, the overall product work by putting all of that effort at the end. Yeah, I think the, you know, the situation, you know, there's a lot of uh, competing, uh, competing interests and uh, the trade-offs, you know, trade-offs that have to be made, you know, so some people may have a particular one particular goal in mind, but uh, but there are other uh, things that really need to be considered taken into the process as a whole, you know, the big picture so that uh, mm -hmm. so, so that, yeah. that increases increases the challenges. Well, some of that plays into the organizational governance as well, um, because you have to be recognizing who needs to be participating in the decisions uh, and making sure they are at the table. Uh, so that you do get a proper perspective on the trade-offs. Uh, too frequently, uh, the decisions are made with a subset of people and you don't have full information around those choices. And you're taking on more risk than you think you are because nobody in the room really understands it. Yep, yep, you gotta have the uh, the right right folks involved in that process, for sure. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, um, so there was an individual um, asking, "How do you so? How do you go from the find and fix vulnerabilities uh, kind of mentality to uh, to practices and procedures that develop, you know, trustworthy high assurance software, you know, without uh, many latent vulnerabilities?" Boy, that's a long leap. Uh, Well, you start, I think, by um, bringing in the tools that you are currently not using and making sure your developers uh, understand how to use them. Um, And I think you will see some immediate improvements of them applying at least a subset of tools. Um, And then from there, increase the sequence of how they're applying the tools and the automated way so that you've got structured processes that they're using so that you can begin to develop repeatability. Uh, Because ultimately what you want is consistent products at the back end um, and not one-offs that, you know, your really good developers do great on these certain pieces and then your new people develop crap that everybody has to clean up because they're not following a standard structure and everybody's kind of doing their own thing. Transitioning over to knowing what those processes are and then understanding them and and growing them for improvement is is the key direction there. Uh, And that requires leadership and management. Great. Thank you. Um, So there's a question about who who do you envision monitoring for security issues for both pipeline and code vulnerabilities? And do traditional security operations teams take this on and learn new tools? Or do you see this being performed in the development teams and interface back to the SecOp teams or, or both? I would say that development and engineering needs to take responsibility for the cybersecurity results because essentially it's their choices, their development approaches, the languages they're using, and the processes they're using that produce the end result. But they also have to be mindful that they need a way of assembling information about what they're doing so that it can be monitored and verified. Uh, because there are there is knowledge of the threat environment and ways in which the the structures and pieces need to be improved constantly to keep up with that because we're in an arms race in terms of the the attack environment and the issues that we're dealing with and it's that partnership that we are really struggling to establish um, we're seeing engineering and development wanting to just run the tools and deal with what the tools tell them and produce an end result. And we're seeing the security people coming in and saying, we want to look at everything we're doing. We can't analyze your stuff early. We've got to see all the parts and pieces together and confirm that you're doing the right controls. Neither one of those approaches is working well, but we need this a partnership of producing the pieces that we need that engineering takes results uh, and takes responsibility for, but they also take responsibility for reporting the results in a way that security can monitor and uh, confirm that they are getting the pieces they're done. Um, Too many systems are built with um, security coming in at the back end, basically running pen testing and slapping the developers with all of these things they haven't done right. Uh, whereas what we're seeing in reality, the developers want to do things the right way. They want to produce a good product. And so I think the more they understand about how to do that and how to show that they're doing that, the better off we'll all be. That's great. Thank you, Carol. So uh, we're getting down to the end of the ta- time here for today's webinar, but uh, there were a couple of questions came in uh, re- regarding uh, the platform and in- independent model that you're, you're developing. Uh, uh, questions about the status, is there a link to it? How, how can folks um, 
you know, uh, no uh, availability, uh, gain access to it. So if, if you got to, you know, can share some info on on uh, on the model itself and how folks might be, um, you know, able to gain access and use this uh, at some point in time. I think the best way for me to suggest right now, we have nothing that's going to be releasable until the fall because we're going to have to go through a lot of internal review steps and, and mother may I to have things that we can share more broadly. Uh, but you have my email address if you want to send me an email and we'll uh, uh, put that uh, together and uh, get information out to you as soon as possible. Okay, that's great. Well, once again, Carol, I want to uh, thank you for taking the time to share uh, your your work with us. I, I think it's an uh, important uh, uh, effort that you're you're undertaking here. Very critical. And um, thanks to our attendees, uh, a lot of great questions today. And I would just like to make a uh, programming note for next month. Uh, we're going to be uh, the the topic is going to be on digital twin uh, technology, and that's going to occur occur on uh, the 13th of July. And that webinar will start at 11 a.m. So if you're interested in that topic, we could, we hope to uh, have you join us for that. And um, with that, once again, Carol, thank you. And everybody, have a great rest of your day. We'll talk to you later. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye.